glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Freedom conquered, all our chains undone. Sin defeated, Jesus is overcome. Mercy triumphed. When the third day dawned, darkness was denied when the storm was gone. Unstoppable God, let your glory go.
the gathering online. At the gathering, we exist to connect people to the love of Jesus. So here we go. Thanks for tuning in online today. Really quick, if you're able to come to church in person at St. FX, we're kicking off the start of the fall season this morning. Kids programs are up and running again. Coffee is back on every week. We're coming together as a church family and it's wonderful. We really would love to have you join us in person. Well, all summer long, Dan Chuck Reed was with us, filling in for Jeff while he was on sabbatical. And this morning is Dan's last official sabbatical filler inner week. He's got one last message for us, which he'll be sharing in a moment, and which you can follow along in you, you version with if you want to take notes and see the scripture references. But I just want to say a huge thank you to Dan for all of the hard work that he did. It was a lot to take on. He was looking after two churches because he's also planting his own church. So it was a super busy time for him, I know. And he made time every week to check in with me and make sure everything was stable and good in my life and in church world. And he's just an awesome dude. And it was a treat to be working alongside him every week. So thank you, Daniel. I've never once called him Daniel, but today it, it felt official. I don't know. If you are able, please reach out to Dan, shoot him a text, send him an email, call him on the phone, thank him for all he's done, be praying for him and his church as well, and just show your appreciation to him any way that you can. Okay, if you're local, and if you like bouncy castles, then come to Mountain Meadows Park this Friday. We are gifting our community a free family fun night with bouncy castles and popcorn and a movie under the stars. It's going to be super fun. It's going to be free and I'm super excited. So join us if you can. And if you want to volunteer, talk to me. Hello, well, seriously, we need volunteers. Reach out to me if you can help. And then two days later, which brings us to next Sunday, September 18th, 
We're welcoming Jeff back from his sabbatical. We're celebrating his return with a barbecue potluck. So join us in person if you can, because it will be a fun morning for sure. All right, before we go on with the morning, let's have a time of worship, and then I'll be back with this morning's scripture. things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the Jesus 
We'd like to give you an opportunity to worship God this morning with your finances by giving back a portion of what God has entrusted to you. Tithing is an act of worship, and as followers of Jesus, tithing is an act of worship that we are called to do. Tithes allow us, as a church, to reach out and connect people to Jesus. So to give this morning, you can go and visit thegatheringottawa.com giving. Thank you for giving. All right, this morning's scripture is from the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, and it reads this, Jesus calms the storm. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you once again that we can come together online. And I want to pray especially uh, over Dan. Thank you so much that Dan was able to come on board extra double duty this summer. He was such a gift to us here at the gathering. And I just ask that you would bless him. I ask that you would give him a time of rest after a busy, busy, busy summer. And I ask that you would just fill him with so much energy and so much, um, I don't know, so much what, what does he need? Fill him with whatever it is that he needs so that he can bless his own church and so that he can take them to where you want them to go. I pray a blessing over all of the Bytown Community Church family that they would be uh, coming together as one unified church, capital C church, and that they would be blessed by Dan and the gift that he is to them and the words that he speaks over them. And I would just pray that you continue to speak through Dan each and every week with his church. And of course, this morning at our church, <laughs> speak through him today as well. We think about all the stuff that we've got coming up. We've got the movie in the park next week, and we've got welcoming Jeff uh, back on Sunday for the for a celebration and a barbecue, and I just pray that you would be with all the stuff that's happening. We want to be able to bless our community on Friday at the movie with our free event, so please help all those pieces come together, and please help us to be a blessing and help those people that come to the movie know who we are and get why we're doing this, why we want to just love on them and show them that we're around so that when they might have a need or a reason or think, hey, wait, wait, I want to go to church, that they would think of us and that they would think of you and that they would be connected to you. Help us to connect people to the love of you. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for this time we have. Prepare our hearts for whatever it is that you've placed on Dan's heart to speak to us today. And we just pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Well, there it was. <laughs> I really hope you guys can come into our in-person service and to the special events that we've got coming up because I miss you. See you soon. Hello, The Gathering. It is crazy to think that um, this is my last week covering Jeff 
And it's been such a pleasure to be with you. And I hope you guys have really enjoyed uh, this past series, um, Experiences with Jesus. And I will see you all soon. And uh, thank you so much for the ways that you partner with us and the ways that you support Bytown Community Church. And hopefully we will see you again soon. And we do really appreciate all of your prayers. You know, I will never forget the moment that I heard the following words from the doctor. It's cancer. I was 31 years old and Melody and I were fairly newly married. We were married about two years by that point. And I was the proud father of a three month old baby, Marcus. And I was learning the ropes as a community pastor of a church that I loved and everything seemed to be going so well. Friendships, church life, marriage. And all of a sudden, everything came crashing down. God, what is happening? Are you actually trustworthy? Can you meet me in the midst of this suffering? And even if you can, do you want to? You know, all of us experience fear. What kinds of things would you say make you most afraid? You know, there's common ones like heights, spiders, public speaking. What would you say you fear most? While maybe like me, you've experienced fear because you were certain that you were gonna die. I'm sure that a few of you have stories, whether that's a near death experience, a crazy health scare, or maybe even daring feats. Perhaps a year or two ago, you found yourself living in constant numbing fear of COVID. Maybe it didn't consume you, but the fear was real. Fear you'd get the virus, fear that you'd accidentally give it to someone you love. Maybe you were afraid for someone else, an aging parent or grandparent, a loved one who's a frontline worker or a friend who just doesn't care about health precautions. Today, we're going to look at a story, and it's one of my favorites, where the disciples, Jesus' apprentices, they were filled with fear. Fear that they would die, but also, interestingly enough, fear of the one they were following. And I'll also tell you part of my story, and the ways that God is meeting me in the face of fear, and the ways that he's revealed himself to me. My hope today is that we would be reminded through this story of how to have faith in the face of fear. When the world feels as though it may crash in around us, when there does not appear to be steady ground to plant our feet upon, when we feel that all of our hopes or our dreams could come crashing down. Through our discussion, through the teaching today, I hope that we will be able to see that Jesus is with us, that he is for us, and that Jesus is still in control. I want you to know that no matter how hard things get, no matter how shipwrecked you may feel, Jesus has still overcome. The text I'm gonna to talk to you about today is Mark 4, verses 35 to 41. And if you're able to open it up and follow along in either your Bible or on a Bible app, um, I would encourage you to do so. This text has been close to my heart for a number of years. I've always appreciated it. A friend of mine actually met Jesus through studying this text. And he would point to that particular night, that particular Bible study, as the time that he decided to become a Christian and encountered Jesus for the first time. So even though this text has been special to me for so many years, what I didn't expect was how it would give context to what was happening in my life through one of my most difficult experiences. Now, before we open up the text, it's really important for you to know the context. So in Mark's gospel account, Jesus has not clearly disclosed to the people who he truly is. He's taking the disciples on a bit of a journey, and he's slowly revealing to them his true identity. 
he's invited disciples to follow him. And they're from all different backgrounds, some of them fishermen. And throughout this story, the disciples are slowly discovering what Jesus, this rabbi that they're following, is capable of. You know, the disciples have heard him teach with power and authority. They see him demonstrating power over sickness and evil. And they encounter him demonstrating authority over their religious laws and traditions, like helping them understand what they can truly do on the Sabbath. And it's kind of like this puzzle. The disciples are still trying to piece together who Jesus truly is and what he is truly capable of. And they're wondering, is he the Messiah that they've been waiting for? The Jewish people have been waiting for a rescuer, one who will set them free from the Roman Empire and help them once again be a nation. And they wonder if he is truly this person that they're waiting for. Or is he just a prophet? Is he just a teacher? His true identity is still a bit of a mystery. So today's story begins with Jesus feeling weary and tired. He, he's just an extended period of time. And the text that the, says the disciples take him into the boat just as he was. So as the disciples head out on the water, a storm arises. And many of the disciples have a fishing background. So they would have known the Sea of Galilee. And they would have had experience with these types of storms. Now the Sea of Galilee is prone to these sudden and violent storms as the wind comes over the mountains, and especially if cool air from the mountains comes into contact with warmer air on the surface of the waters. So we notice that even though these men are well acquainted with the sea, this particular storm causes them great fear. The disciples run over to Jesus and they awaken him in a panic. Do you not care if we perish, they ask. The disciples are afraid to the point that they accuse their friend and their leader of not even caring if they die. Now this claim seems quite cruel to state that Jesus, who we believe is the embodiment of love, does not even care. Well, I'm honest with, if I'm honest with you, when I look at my own life, I am also guilty of uh, saying to Jesus, do you not care about me? I probably even had that thought to some extent today. We must remember the context of the story. These 12 men find themselves in a boat that is filling with water and appears likely to capsize at any moment. These men, especially those with experience of the sea, they're assessing the situation. They are very discouraged. And in addition, Jesus is sleeping. How could anyone sleep through a situation like this one? Remember that these men are fishermen. They know the waters extremely well. They spend most of their time on the water. They're deeply connected to it. For them to be frightened, it is significant. And not only that, the text says that Jesus is sleeping on the cushion in the stern. And many commentators believe that the cushion was the seat for the person steering the boat. No wonder the disciples are upset. Could you imagine being in a boat in a storm where the driver is sleeping on the job? Fear is powerful and it is, there is this primitive place in our brains that we go to when we perceive a threat. It shuts down our imagination and our creativity. We feel stuck, trapped, doomed. We look for someone or something to lash out at or to blame and anything that could help us feel a restored sense of control. With great fear and perhaps frustration, the people ask Jesus if he still cares for them. And Jesus responds in a remarkable way. He does not apologize for sleeping. He does not start steering the boat. He does not get defensive. And he does not bark orders to the men and take control. No, instead, Jesus gets up. And he simply says, quiet, be still. And suddenly there is a great calm a stillness, a peace, similar to when the creator hovered over the deep, dark waters in Genesis 1-1. 
Jesus exerts authority over the wind and the waves. Now, for us to fully understand the power of Jesus's miracle of calming the wind and the waves, we must understand the significance of water at this time. The worldview at that time equated the sea with powers of evil and destruction. People could not swim. They feared the waters. They believed demons lived in the water. And because the sea was uncontrollable, people believed monsters resided in the seas and then no person could have authority over it. Jesus's demonstration of power equates him with God alone. Only creator has control over the wind and the waves. And the disciples are shocked and in awe. (laughs) There is a stillness all around them, but a new storm brews deep in their hearts. And the disciples are filled with fear. They had no idea that their leader had authority over the heavens and the earth. They had not anticipated that he would respond this way or could respond this way. And Jesus perceives what is happening in their hearts and the storm of questions that they're experiencing. And he says to them, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And it would appear, at least in this text, faith and fear are contrasted. Where we are struggling with fear, it comes from a lack of faith. (coughs) You know, it is hard to have faith in the face of fear. Faith that we'll have enough money or that we'll be provided for when we get laid off. Faith that we'll be loved and received when we admit our shortcomings and our faults. Faith that we'll make it through the abuse or the pain that we have faced. Faith that the world will not become more divided and cruel as our politics seem to become more and more polarized. And society is way less clear on what is true. Faith that God is bigger than the diagnosis and that God can heal. And that even if he doesn't, that somehow he's still good, powerful, and in control. Faith that it's better for me to give up control of my life and surrender my life to God than to be in control and able to call all the shots. These disciples had no idea that Jesus was God and that he could control all of nature. They did not know that he had been with God at creation and that he was God. They're just left simply asking, who Jesus was. You know, six years ago, I was diagnosed with a rare neck cancer in my salivary gland. My son Marcus was only three months old. And at the time I remember being overcome with fear, fear of death, fear of suffering, fear of the unknown. My greatest fear was that my little boy would be fatherless and that he would grow up feeling like there was a giant hole within his heart and his soul. When I was diagnosed, the doctor was not very hopeful. The cancer would be slow growing, but it would be ruthless. It may take 20 years, he said, but it would slowly move from the neck to the lungs. And I had this image of a monster lurking in the shadows. Melody and I obviously were devastated. We didn't know how to respond, but we invited people to pray. And as people prayed, numerous people had this story come to their minds. Though we were afraid, though life was spinning out of control, we had to believe that Jesus was with us and that he was big enough to hold these difficulties in his hands. If I'm honest with you, the last six years have been extremely difficult. I went through neck surgery and radiation in the summer of 2016. Then I had a small break. In faith, we had a second child and then cancer returned in spring of 2018. It was devastating. We pushed through that. And then again, in January, 2019, I received the news that there was a new spot on my left lungs. It had only been six months since my last surgery. It was going to be my third surgery in three years. I was preparing for the worst. On February 20th, 2019, the doctors went in and with thousands of people praying. 
They were shocked when the spot that had appeared on my CT was gone. The nurses affirmed that this occurrence was extremely rare and nodules do not magically disappear like this very often. Shockingly, my community rejoiced, saying it was a miracle. And the shock was so great that I was angry with God. How could this have happened? All of the follow-up tests show that the nodule is gone and that afterwards there was nothing there. I'm not exactly sure what happened. All I know is that there was a spot and then there wasn't. All I know is that thousands of people have been praying. All I know is that God is doing a, a work in the depths of my own heart. In my life, Jesus is bringing a greater ability to trust him, to rely on him, to know that he is for me. I feel more, than, more free than ever before and more aware of his love. It's crazy to admit this, but I felt bad when this spot was gone because I had a hard time believing that God would love me enough then maybe he would want to heal me. I'm trying to grow in trusting him more and more than ever before, learning how to look for him to be my source of affirmation, joy, stability, and comfort. I'm learning how to let go of control and understand and knowing that I don't understand everything. I don't have all the right answers. All I know is that in my life, there's a giant storm. And I, like the disciples, ask Jesus if he even cares if I die. I also know that Jesus is bringing a greater sense of peace and calm. And I'm amazed. I never expected for these kind of outcomes. I didn't think that Jesus would want to miraculously heal a guy like me. My whole life, I've kind of felt overlooked, and yet Jesus had seen me, and I realized that he may have worked powerfully in my life so that I could realize even just a bit more his deep, deep love for me. First John 4.18 says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. I'm beginning to understand that in the midst of fear, I need to know more and more the depths of God's love for me. And it's only when I can embrace his love and stand steadfast in his love that I can be freed from the fear that lurks in the shadows. His love allows me to have faith and to know that he will be faithful, even if the worst case scenario were to happen. Unfortunately, in the last year, my cancer has returned. There's currently um, cancer on my lungs and there's unfortunately too many spots for them to remove. In many ways, I still find myself living in this place of uncertainty. And there's still this massive need to trust God and to know that he is with me, to trust that he loves me and trust him in the face of fear. You know, every time I'm exercising and I can't quite push as hard as I did the time before, my first fear is that the cancer has returned. Or not returned, I know it's returned, that the cancer has grown. And God bless my wife, she often pulls me off the cliff and helps me rest again in God's love for me and trusting that he is with us. It's a very interesting season in my life as I seek to plant a church. I often question, God, why would you invite me to plant a church? You know, what if our church continues to grow, which our little church plan is, and then suddenly I cannot continue? I'm so worried I'm going to disappoint people. I'm so worried I'm going to fail. And I always feel this tension whenever I commit to something, like I'm doing a wedding in January. And I always kind of fear, 
what if I can't follow through on this commitment? Daily, I'm learning to trust God. Trust that he will be faithful to us. Trust that he will provide for us. And I need to learn what it looks like to live a life with faith. But he'll lead us, whatever the worst scenario may be. What does it look like to have trust? That he'll be faithful to me, to my family, and to Bytown. And that Jesus ultimately is, there, is our pastor and our leader. And it's simply just a gift for me to get to be father, husband, and pastor in this season. You know, I have no idea what you are facing today and what kind of storm you find yourself in. But you need to know that God is faithful to you. He sees you. He is with you. He's not forgotten you. And he is good. Do you believe that Jesus still today has the power to calm the wind and the waves? Do you believe that he is in the boat with you? Do you believe that through his death and his resurrection that we can have peace in our hearts and live a life full of hope, joy, and love? Jesus is the only reliable anchor to turn to in the storms, the only one who can rescue us, the only one powerful enough to carry us through. When everything is seemingly falling apart, he is still in control. And I'm thankful that the story did not end here. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He died for the very people who killed him on the cross. He rose on the third day and was ascended to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God. And he sent his spirit to dwell within us, comforting us and empowering us and helping us follow him because he knew it would not be easy. Jesus is amazing. And I want to invite you to say yes to following him today, whether that's for the first time, the 10th time, or the 1,000th time. It's important for us to acknowledge that we are lost without him, that we're sinking in a capsizing boat, and that we need him to enter into our lives. It's important for us to acknowledge that we cannot deal with the storms of life on our own. I want to encourage you to surrender your life to him again and ask Jesus for his forgiveness and for his help. It doesn't matter how broken or destroyed your dreams are. You need to know that Jesus is bigger. As we go into the world, hang on to the truth that Jesus is with us. No matter what we may face, no matter how big the waves, no matter how much it looks like the boat is going to sink. Furthermore, we have the promise that we're not trying to make it through life alone. For those of us that are following Christ, the Spirit comes and he dwells within us. And he enables us to live as God's representatives of peace and love to this hurting world. And we also have the gift of the church. God's people to encourage us and help us in times of difficulty. Don't try to face the storms of life on your own. Make sure you have good people around you who love you and support you. Practically, in the places where you feel like you, your life is capsizing and you are in the midst of a storm, where you're overcome with fear and with doubt, come to God in prayer. Release to him your struggles and your stress and ask him to give us faith that he's still working and moving. There are tons of contemplative prayer practices that are out there that can help us focus in on who God is and who he says that we are. Whatever fear you're facing today, no matter how big of a difficulty, may faith come as a gift. May God grant you the strength to trust him, to love him with a full heart and to remain faithful to him. May you receive his peace today. I'm going to pray. Father God, we thank you for your love. Father God, we thank you for your grace. Father, we thank you for your mercy. You are so good to us, and we love you. Jesus, I don't know what storms people are facing today. God, I don't know what things feel like they're at risk of um, 
completely turning people's lives upside down. However, Jesus, I believe that you are peace. God, may you come into the places where we are afraid. May we be willing to confess our fears to you. And God, would you come and would you bring us the gift of faith in the midst of our fear? God, we need you. We love you. And we pray that you would come and work in our hearts and in our lives today. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So good to be with you all. Blessings. And it's been so great to be with you all this summer. God bless. Like